Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. I've been getting a lot of requests that I do a video that explains knife law. Unfortunately, that's not going to be something I can take care of in just one video, unless that video was way too long for anyone to watch, including myself. I'm not going to do that to myself. So I want to start off by hitting some of the big cases and one I want to deal with is the case of Richard and Walker, or the Queen and Richard and Walker. It's a case from 1981. Now, I think most of this case holds up still and describes the state of the criminal law with respect to the idea of what constitutes a prohibited knife. Now, you'll note I said the criminal law. There appears to be a different standard that's emerged with respect to the CBSA, that's the Canadian Border Services Agency, and the trade tribunals that, uh, that deal with that. That I'll cover in a future video. Uh, there's a few other issues that I want to cover. Knife law is going to be a bit of a complex subject, but let's dive in. This is a great case to look at, and I want to go through it with you guys. So as mentioned, this is the case of the, uh, the Queen and Richard and Walker. We see right at the start, this is a bit of a, a bit of background. So these two were tried together and each was convicted of the offense of having in his possession a prohibited weapon, that being a buck knife, contrary to the provisions of section 88 sub 1. Now I want to note something. This is a 1981 case. So where they're talking about the sections of the criminal code, a lot of those have changed. Section 88 1 is now possession of a weapon for purposes dangerous to the public peace. And so here, when they say the definition of a knife, which is contained in section 82 1B, that's now in section 84. So it's moved around a bit. However, when they say prohibited weapon means A and B it, in recent changes have flipped, but the key part is the same language. And that key part is the any knife that has a blade that opens automatically by gravity or centrifugal force or by hand pressure applied to a button, spring, or other device in or attached to the handle of the knife. So that describes a prohibited style knife, which is one that if you think of the standard switchblade from you know 50s movies and so forth, where somebody pushes a button and I've got a little tiny knife here, but if you can imagine something where you have a little button on the side, you push it and it flicks out. Now there's going to be the question of what happens if you have a flipper. That I'll probably deal with more in a future video. But we see the judge of the Court of Queen's Bench held that the buck knife found in the possession of each of the appellants was a prohibited weapon. So this was the previous level of court. On this appeal, uh, counsel argued a number of things. So these are the grounds of appeal. These are the issues that this appeals court is going to be dealing with because an appeals court isn't a trial level decision. It's a court of a higher level that is examining a decision below and determining if it's correct or not. And when you appeal a decision, you appeal on certain grounds and those are the grounds that the court considers. You have to tell them what issues you want them to look at. You can't just say, I think the decision is wrong. So the first ground is in making a finding of fact. Now to explain what that means, there's both findings of fact and findings of law and findings of fact are typically harder to appeal. So just so you're aware, that's what they're talking about here. In making a finding of fact, which was totally unsupported by the evidence adduced at trial in the provincial court, to wit, the knives would open by a device in or attached to the handle. The next issue was in applying the test, that he did to make the definition of a prohibited weapon in section 82 of the criminal code of Canada include the knives of the appellants by not applying an appropriate meaning to the word opens automatically and device. So basically they're saying that the trial judge got those terms wrong. Next in failing to give any consideration to the design and capability of the device, essential elements of the offense charged. And then in finding that he had no jurisdiction to view the exhibits or conduct a demonstration with respect thereto. So the knives would have been put into evidence in court. And they're complaining that the trial judge didn't actually look at and play with and examine the knives. I'm guessing that they asked for that to happen at the trial level. So that's potentially a ground of appeal here. 
And next, by affirming the convictions of the appellants for the offense of possession of a prohibited weapon without giving consideration to the requisite mens rea of said offense. So mens rea, if you've seen previous uh, videos, you'll know that that means the guilty mind. Any criminal offense, you need the guilty mind. So what was going on in your head? If you stole something, did you mean to take it? Or did you, you know, what did somebody pull the fire alarm and you just ran out and you forgot you had a, you know, a basket of goods? That's not meaning to steal it. So that's the mens rea issue. But there's also the actus reus, so the guilty act. In the, uh, the theft example, leaving the store without paying for it would be the actus reus. So then they go on to describe what these knives are. So all of these knives were designed with a folding blade three and three quarter inches or more in length. The cutting edge of each, when closed, folds into the handle. A narrow length of steel running along the full length of the back of the handle operates as a spring to lock the blade open and also acts to keep the cutting edge confined within the handle when the knife is closed. The blade of the buck knife is designed to be opened for use by grasping its handle with one hand and pulling or unfolding the blade from the handle with the other. In this respect, buck knives are similar in design to an ordinary pocket knife. Now, just so you're aware, most pocket knives or a lot of pocket knives will follow this design, uh, or they may follow a similar design. There are other means to accomplish the same thing. But they note, the blade locks when fully opened. There is a depression in the back of the handle which permits pressure to be applied to the steel bar running the length of the handle so as to release the locking tension on the blade when open and permit it to be closed. Three, the blade and handle are larger and heavier than a pocket knife, allowing a much greater centrifugal force to be applied to the blade for the purpose of opening it for use. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to get my camera to zoom in properly, but this is what they're talking about. Not this exact knife, this is a very, it's an inexpensive small uh, small knife here. I know I got this as a gift. It's There's no paid, uh, there's no uh, sponsorship or anything. But you see how it's got a little piece at the back, which can be depressed. And that the purpose of that is that you can pull the knife open with your hands, but once it's open, you don't want it closing. And the reason why you don't want it closing is that if you're holding the knife, you don't want something like that pressing on it to start costing you fingers. So once that's pressed in, it releases the lock that allows the blade to close again. That's the sort of design they're talking about here. So In the trial court, it was demonstrated that a knife which had been used for a considerable period of time had different characteristics than a similar knife which had not been used. When the spring in the handle weakens through use or is not sufficiently strong, it is possible in some instances, without applying any pressure on the steel bar in the area of the depression, to grasp the handle and open the blade by a flicking motion of the arm and wrist. So what they're saying here, and people may have some experience with this, is that as these knives get old, they can change. And those features that may be intended to keep it from opening with a hand gesture or the like, those can break down. And so a knife can get loose and sloppy. That's going to be something the court looks at here. So in my opinion, the question whether a knife is prohibited weapon depends on the design and the condition of the particular knife. So they describe a hunting knife and they note how it's still dangerous, even though it doesn't fold, but that doesn't fall within the definition. Having regard to the purpose of the prohibition, I do not agree that a knife is open if the cutting edge of the blade merely emerges from the handle by a few degrees. So something like that is what they're talking about. So would that count as opening the knife? And the court here is saying, no, that doesn't. I consider the word open means open with the capacity for use as a weapon. To interpret open so broadly as to include a blade which, when pressure is applied to the locking device on the handle, would cause the blade to drop open a few degrees below the handle and spring back into the handle when the pressure is released, would be to misconstrue the intent of the legislation. A pocket knife with a blade in such a position could not be used as a weapon, and so is not therefore a prohibited weapon. This is, he's looking at the intent of the legislation. What were they trying to ban? 
So if you think about a knife that when you press on the back, it drops down just a little bit and we have that little tiny gap, you're not going into a fight with a knife held out like that. So they're saying that is probably not enough to count or in the view of this decision is not enough to count as open for the meaning of that. The words prohibited weapon are given a specific meaning in the criminal code and any knife that is included in the definition of prohibited weapon as set out uh, is a prohibited weapon, uh, whether or not as a knife it comes within the ordinary meaning of weapon. So what this means is that the knife doesn't have to be designed or intended for use as a weapon if it meets those categories where it can be flicked open or opened by gravity or by a button. So it doesn't have to be a weapon. Other prohibited weapons have to be a weapon first, not under this category. Similarly, a knife may be a prohibited weapon even though it was not designed to be used as such if in fact its blade through wear or alteration can be fully open for use by applying centrifugal force or gravity to the blade or by applying pressure to a button spring or device in or attach the handle. In other words, it is the capability and not the design of the knife which determines whether or not it has a prohibited weapon. The design or intended use of the knife has no part in the determination of whether the knife is or is not a prohibited weapon. It is the capability of the knife to be used as a weapon which is material. This is important. If we think of that wear and tear issue, if your knife wears out to the point where now it just flicks open, it has become a prohibited weapon. There is other case law that I'm not reviewing today, but in it was actually in the context of magazines and if the magazine breaks, and it would similarly apply to firearms, if you have a firearm that malfunctions in such a fashion that it becomes fully automatic or some similar thing, uh, you'd have a, a, basically you'd have a responsibility to act quickly to either repair it or dispose of it. You can't just keep it around and say, oh, well, now that it's uh, damaged and works better, I'm going to keep it because I like it this way. That'll get you into trouble. So they noted that with the knives that they had in front of them, and this is, again, a 1981 case, so there's other knives that open in different ways, but they, they talk about six ways for these to open. The first is by depressing the steel bar in the handle and allowing gravity to drop the blade open or partially open. So that would be if you press this and the blade just falls open. This knife does not do that for obvious reasons. I don't have any prohibited knives and this would be a prohibited weapon. So number two is by holding the knife handle and applying centrifugal force to the blade by a throwing motion to open the blade. So this one won't open, but if it did, it would be snap and open. Again, that would make it a prohibited knife, prohibited weapon. Three, by depressing the steel bar in the back of the handle to release the pressure or tension holding back, holding the blade closed, and by applying centrifugal force to the blade by means of a throwing motion. This one, I can't even do it with one hand to properly, it's got a very stiff bar, but you can imagine one where you can push the steel bar and flick, and then it'll flick open. That would also be a prohibited weapon. Four, by holding the knife blade and applying centrifugal force to the handle. So if we think of that, and this one, I don't know if it'll work on this one here. However, I can demonstrate holding the knife blade. It's a little awkward from this position. So we can see that. Again, holding the blade, centrifugal force to the handle. I'm already giving you some spoilers because I'm pretty fastidious about the law here. Five, by using our one hand to release the tension of the blade and then pushing the blade, uh, pulling or pushing the blade open, so like that. Or six, by holding the handle with one hand and opening the blade with the other hand. Or sorry, five would be by using one hand, so pushing or pulling the blade open. Methods five and six do not bring the knives within the definition of a prohibited weapon. Method four, which is the one I just showed you, the that one, would require the user of the knife holding it by the blade after it was open. To use it as a weapon, he would have to change the position of his hand on the knife, 
not only by shifting his grip to the handle, but also by reversing the direction in which the blade was pointing. So if you think of somebody who you've got to readjust in order to use it as a weapon. It's, you're not going to use it as a weapon while you're holding it like this. Uh, to effectively apply centrifugal force to the handle of the knife while holding the blade, the throwing motion and flick of the wrist required must be in an outward direction away from the body, which would result in the blade when open, pointing at the user and the handle pointing away from him. Now, I've shown it working in a different way. They're assuming here that it would be more like that. But that's clearly not required. I hope those clicks aren't too bad in the, uh, the final cut here. I would interpret any knife that has a blade that opens automatically by a centrifugal force as meaning one that opens by means of centrifugal force applied to the blade and not to the handle. And they cite a case for that. Then when the appellant's buck knives were held horizontally, the blade does not move or even partially open when pressure is applied to the steel bar. And he's not referring to it as a locking device because some knives have locking devices that keep them closed, which is useful because you don't necessarily want a knife that opens in your pocket. And some knives have things that keep them locked open, which is also really useful because otherwise it's just very dangerous to your fingers. So there, there's some discussion of that. We'll skip ahead. Assuming this premise, I would conclude that any knife which when held in a position where the handle is above the blade and the blade drops open at or about a 90 degree angle to the handle and by gravity continues to fully open available for use when the handle is placed in a vertical position or when centrifugal force is applied to a partially open blade is a knife having a blade that opens automatically by gravity or centrifugal force and is therefore a prohibited weapon. So they're saying it would be a banned weapon and this is a very thorough decision. They're going through a lot of possibilities here. So if you were to push the back bar and it drops open, and then from there you were able to flick it open, that would also be a prohibited weapon. Now, Mr. Richard's knife could only be opened by methods four and six. That is by holding the blade and applying centrifugal force to the handle, and by one hand holding the handle and the other pulling open the blade. So that knife is not a prohibited weapon. But we also have Mr. Walker. And Mr. Walker's knife was opened in court by a witness applying method three, which was the pushing the bar down and then flicking it open. The judge notes, I can't open it as did the witness. And there's no evidence that Walker could so open it. And there was evidence that Walker was unaware it could be opened by any method other than method six. So that's where we're looking. That's the state of the evidence here. It is necessary to consider other aspects of the requirement that the blade opens automatically by gravity or centrifugal force. I would interpret these words as meaning that the blade opens by centrifugal force when that force is applied by human hands, not by a machine. Because if you think about it, there's all sorts of wonderful engineering channels on YouTube. And I'm sure some of those clever individuals could build a centrifugal force device to open a blade that no human ever could. And if, if it was by machine, it would be almost impossible to have any knife that opens that would not count as opening in that fashion. It would be a, a particular engineering task to build one that couldn't be opened by a machine. So this raises a further question, namely, does this requirement contemplate that a knife is a prohibited weapon if only a very few persons have the strength and dexterity to open it by centrifugal force and make it available for use so that everyone who possesses such a knife is a possessor of a prohibited weapon, even though he himself cannot so open it? So skipping ahead a little further. This is a part where I think that this decision would not hold up very well. This is, I hold that the charge under section 881, which is no longer 881, of having possession of a prohibited weapon is one of strict liability and that the burden of proving absence of guilty knowledge rests upon the defendant. I don't think this would hold up anymore. Uh, this strict liability in criminal cases, that's, that's basically uh, been done away with. But Detective DeGrace testified at trial 
that he could he could open the appellant walker's knife in only one way apart from using both hands one on the handle and one on the blade namely by grasping the blade and applying centrifugal force to the handle which again is the method that the court has already said is not prohibited further stated that he could not open it by pushing on the steel bar on the handle and applying centrifugal force to the blade however detective thorne was able to fully open the blade of walker's knife in court by using method three that is by holding the knife in one hand depressing the metal bar and by a throwing motion applying sufficient centrifugal force to open the blade fully in his demonstration of this method it was only on the third attempt that he succeeded in opening the knife so one detective out of the two there was able to do it and not on the first try not on the second try he got it on the third try we also see managers of sporting goods departments of various stores were called so they came in as witnesses who testified that buck knives or knives of similar design were sold in their stores and that they had been advised by the police and other officials that these knives were legal and were not prohibited weapons such evidence does not establish the legality of such knives but it does tend to show what a reasonable and prudent man would know or believe about the characteristics of the knives what they're saying here is they brought in a bunch of people saying we sell these knives we've been told they're they're legal they're legit that doesn't tell us they're legal but it goes to the mens rea to the guilty mind aspect of whether we should expect that mr walker would know about this because if this is something you can only get at cd back alley shops or online uh, aliexpress if you go and look there there is a wealth of prohibited weapon designs that you should not order and you should be aware as well that the customs is more than aware of the issues there and you're likely to get caught don't do it however it is a great place to go if you want to see what these things look like because they will have all sorts of designs and in some future videos i will probably be sort of pointing to things for sale there the appellant walker testified he had never opened his knife except by method six that is with two hands and they would never seen anyone try to open any knife such as his by applying centrifugal force to the blade until he observed the demonstration in court maybe that's accurate maybe that's not we've already seen the trial judge didn't believe him so that's important so while the evidence shows that it is possible for a person with sufficient strength and practice to open walker's knife by applying centrifugal force to the blade it was also established that other persons including a detective on the saint john police force was unable to do so and that still others were unaware that this could happen now they note the burden of proof cast upon mr walker again i don't think that this is really going to hold up in terms of modern case law how so this case is really presented to show the examination of the different classifications of how a knife can open and not so much for the mens rea part that part i think is no good anymore the trial judge did not believe mr walker when he testified that he did not know his knife would open by force applied to the handle but in giving his reasons for convicting mr walker it is clear the judge had reference to the opening of the knife by grasping the blade and applying centrifugal force to the handle so once again that method so he did not however direct his attention to the question of mr walker's knowledge as to whether the knife would open by applying centrifugal force to the blade had he considered the evidence of various witnesses that they could not open the knife in that way and were unaware it could be so opened the trial judge may not have disbelieved the appellant in relation to that manner of opening the blade note that the the court of appeal here is examining that decision and finding that the reasoning is faulty but what they don't do is they don't make a new determination because that's not the judge of the court of appeal normally what would happen here if they determine that's an error is they might send the matter back down for a new trial so that that issue could be heard and evaluated by by the court skipping ahead a bit detective thorn on a third attempt was able to fully open the blade of mr walker's knife by holding the handle and applying centrifugal force to the blade that evidence by itself brings mr walker's knife within the definition of a prohibited weapon it would appear to be irrelevant that other persons including the accused were unable to so open the knife the definition includes 
any knife that has a blade that opens without any reference to the act of opening being attributable to the person found in possession of it. That's complicated language. What they mean here is it doesn't matter if you're not capable of opening the knife. What matters is that somebody can. So you could picture this in trial where they might bring the biggest gorilla on the police force out to show that your knife can be flicked open. The difference, of course, is that if you yourself are unable to do it, it's going to be a lot harder for them to establish the mens rea aspect with respect to you. Because in theory, you might have knives right now that could be opened by somebody out there, and you just don't know it. If you watch the strongman competitions, some of those people are Im truly impressive, the things they do. I don't know. This knife is very, very stiff. But maybe one of those guys who can pull a truck could flick this open. I don't know. I don't think so. But I don't know. But in terms of the mens rea, it'd be difficult to establish if if it's not something that you can flick open or that some sort of ordinarily strong person could do. Now, I'll just note here in terms of the decision, they determined that uh, with respect to Mr. Richard, his knife was not a prohibited weapon and therefore it didn't matter what his mens rea was. So that was not a, a question. Now, with respect to Mr. Walker's knife, the one that could be opened by that one detective, they determined that that was a prohibited weapon. Now, he, normally what would have happened here, as I mentioned, is that they would send this matter back to, back to trial in order for a judge to determine the mens rea issue. So they say, the above reasons applicable to Mr. Walker's case would normally result in a new trial being ordered. However, they go on to say the suspension of sentence by the trial judge and the imposition of a probation order, both of which have long since expired, was an appropriate disposition if Mr. Walker were to be found guilty. So he got probation for this, and they're saying that would have been appropriate. However, he did all of his probation. His probation ran out and is done. He should not receive additional punishment. The Crown has not appealed his sentence. The Crown hasn't said, we wanted a bigger, you know, we wanted jail time. We wanted something else. He says, I would therefore, as did the Appeal Court of Ontario in the Phillips case, allow the appeal, set aside the conviction, exercise my discretion, and direct a verdict of acquittal be entered. So the reason why he's directing the verdict of acquittal here is because Mr. Walker has already done all of the punishment he'd get if this matter went back and he were convicted. So there's no reason to send him back for another trial where there's not any more sentence to be had. So he's just directing an acquittal. You also think that Mr. Walker would be looking at no real additional sentence, but he's going to have all the cost and difficulty inherent to running that trial. It's not really in the public interest, so that's why the judge is exercising this discretion here. And he just acquits him. Note that that's to Mr. Walker's benefit, because at the end of the day, he doesn't get a criminal record for that. So what we see here is a, a detailed discussion of various kinds of fairly ordinary pocket knives and how they might open. You can go back and refer to those six, uh, six types of opening and a discussion of which ones count as band knives and which ones don't. In my view, this is a good sort of statement of the law as it stands with respect to this. But there's a whole lot of additional knife issues. I'm looking to make some follow-up videos. One I want to discuss is the way the Canadian Border Services Agency has decided to interpret knives as compared to how the criminal courts have interpreted them. I do hope that this has been interesting and enlightening. Uh, please let me know in the comments below, do you want to see more knife content, more firearm content, more other content? Uh, if this has been helpful, please like, share, and subscribe. It's really helping the channel grow. I appreciate it greatly. I also have a Patreon if you want to leave a tip. Thank you once again, and have a good evening.